Welcome to all those joining us live on YouTube. This is Genes, Destiny, and Aging with our speaker, Catherine Weir. This class is being brought to you by Osher Lifelong Learning at George Mason. If you're interested in OLLI at George Mason, please visit our website, olli.gmu.edu. Kathy, go ahead, please. Okay, um, we're into the third week about genes, destiny, and aging. And if you remember from the beginning, just to give you an overview, we started with some early studies, um, even some uh, in the sixth uh, century BCE. Um, but mainly we looked at handedness and brainedness. And we also talked about that 98% of genes for all humans are the same. So that when we're talking about attributing individual differences to genetic causes or environmental causes, we're really looking at that extra 2%. Um, most of the things that are controlled by gen genes and environment are the same for all humans. Um, last week, I introduced the method or the, actually it's gonna turn out to be the simple method of the behavioral geneticists um, to figure out what proportion of the variability of a particular thing that you're looking at, we were looking at intelligence last week, is due to genetics and what is the contribution of environment. And we're going to apply this method to many other kinds of behaviors and traits uh, this week, as well as intelligence to some personality variables and to um, uh, variables, one of which um, is where people fall on a continuum between being conservative or liberal, political ideas. And next week, we're gonna look at how um, and the instances where genetics and environment work together and the more modern approach, which attempts to tie to specific genes, the genetic effects that they find. So today we're just going to review a little bit about the behavior genetic method applied to intelligence, look specifically at some personality traits, and then we're going to look at behavior genetics of attitudes and some social interactions. And we're gonna look at political attitudes, religion and marriage and divorce or attitudes toward measure at marriage and divorce. Um, I apologize, I am glad that so many of you have still decided to come instead of time sharing with the media to watch the Senate. Um, but maybe we can explain why people vote which way by the end and the people watching the media might not. So perhaps you got some reward for coming. Um, near the end last time, we, it was somebody brought up that when you have a correlation, that remember that's that number R that characterizes similarity, uh, mm -hmm. that when you square the variance, uh, sorry, when you square the correlation, little r squared, it tells you about the percentage of variance. And I want to try to explain when r squared works and why when we're calculating the genetic and environmental components to something like intelligence, it doesn't involve squaring the r's. So let's just here talk about um, what happens when you have two scores that you've obtained on the same person or from a pair of related people, let's say a father and a daughter, um, it, then it's possible to work out the correlation between them as a quantity about how similar they are on intelligence or anything else. And for instance, it's been found that IQ scores, that's some sort of a test that uh, both the fathers and daughters have taken, um, correlates with the uh, GPA that people get in school, the grade point average, at about 0.5. So if those are two different people in the pair, we've tested IQ, we've, test, we've got hold of their GPA, and if we 
find that correlations 0.5, if we square that, that's the proportions of the variance or the variability shared by IQ and the GPA. And if you square 0.5, you come up with 0.25. And my, whoops, sorry, my um, a, a picture here is to show that the red is like the IQ score. I've used red uh, in the sentence on the left. And the blue square or rectangle is the GPA. And they share about 25% of the variance whereas 75% of the IQ variance doesn't overlap with the GPA and 75% of the GPA doesn't overlap with IQ, just 25%. That's pretty standard statistics that I hope a lot of you have studied in the past. We also looked last time at GPA correlated with job success and the value that was given, it was a 1989 study, um, was 0.11. So if we square 0.11, you actually get 0 0.0121. And I'm just going to call it 1%, if that's okay with you guys. And if I make a picture of this, whoops, let me go back. I make a picture of it. Um, a, a GPA and job success only overlap a tiny bit. I've exaggerated it here. It's like whatever GPA measures isn't the same thing as job success measured. And job success was defined in that study as superiors ratings of the work of a person um, and uh, uh, I think one other measure of success. Um, but when we looked at IQ correlated with job success, the correlation was 0.53. And if you square 0.53, you get 0.28 with a few other things in the distant decimal places. So we could say 28% overlap. It's more like the situation we had up here with IQ accounting for probably 72% of the variance and it overlaps with job success, um, just 28% with 72% uh, of job success, that's now in the blue, um, uh, in that overlap. But we talked about pie chart representations for the genetic and environmental influences on the IQ. And if you'll bear with me for another slide or two, I hope to be able to show you why it, we didn't do any squaring of the Rs when we were looking and estimating G and E. Well, for IQ at age 12, uh, that was when you got people who were age 12. Most of these studies used twins so that it would be twin partner one, twin partner two were given IQ tests. And they were able, you could work out after you worked out the similarity between them using the correlation coefficient R, you could use that to work out the heritability or the genetic variance accounted for in IQ. And it was around 52%. Um, the, we talked also about the shared family environment and the variance it accounts for is 0.19. IQ tests tend to have very low error rates. It's about 8% um, in IQ tests. Uh, and in um, so the unaccounted for and the behavior geneticists labeled this the non-shared environment, the way individuals in the same family don't have the same things happen to them. One might play um, a lot of soccer and get um, some sort of a serious head injury from heading the ball too much. And the other sibling doesn't have that happen at all. And so it would be something not shared, even if they live in the same family. And that would account for the rest, 4.21. Well, here are the steps of the behavior genetics approach and why it's different than just talking about R squared when you measure the correlation or similarity between two uh, different mm -hmm. scores from pairs of people 
you it knowing about the genetic link it doesn't involve them having taken any tests giving you any scores we don't know what their iq is um all we know is that with pairs of people and we're going to look at of course um, monozygotic and dizygotic twins, the identical and the fraternals, um, we know how much uh, uh, of the genetic material they share, 100% for the monozygotic or identical twins and 50% um, for the dizygotic or the fraternal twins. That's independent logic. It doesn't depend on their scores on IQ. Um, we determine the shared environment between the pair, also using independent logic. We say, these guys were living in the same household. That's the definition chosen by the behavior geneticists. They could have chosen other um, ways of uh, dealing with it, but this was the way that they chose in the culture of their academic field. So an example would be the social class parental education, and then we had a lot more in a list of possible shared environmental effects. In our third step, when we're doing the behavior genetics, we work out the conceptual equations for the pair based on this external logic that, that what's the genetic linkage and what um, is the shared environment depending on that definition. So if we look at what's shared by a parent and a child, it's half of their genetic material and they've been in the same family. Um, and so we get a component here for shared environment. What about an adopting parent and an adopted child? Well, they don't share any of uh, this bit of the genetic material that makes people different because when conception takes place, it's supposed to take place randomly. Um, and for the alleles that make us different at 2%. So all they have in common is the shared environment. What about a biological parent and the adopted away child? This might be a mother who, for whatever reason, had the child adopted away. Um, and what happens is they share half of their genes. We haven't done any tests of these kids, this, these pairs of people. All we've done is do external independent logic. Fourth, now we give the pairs the tests, the IQ tests, and we work out the correlation between the scores. And from that, we can estimate the heritability, the genetic component, and the shared environment component for the group that we've tested. And we also have to take account of other influences like the error of measurement of the test. And when people make a standardized test, it actually takes many years and they the manufacturer will tell you how much error there is in the test. Um, I know many people were up, have been uptight about COVID tests because um, their errors of measurement vary a great deal. Um, and there are set ways to determine the average error of measurement. And anything left over goes into this thing that's called non-shared, sometimes called unique variants, sometimes called leftover or residual for in, from the environment because it's not genetic and it's not shared environment. Well, Here's one of those uh, transparencies from the distant past when people taught with transparencies. And I thought it just gives us a good summary of all the things that we could do, um, it, or, or not all, many. Um, this is, if, if you look, the genetic overlap between the pairs, identical twins reared together. The second one has 100% again, of genetic overlap with identical twins reared apart. And if you look at what's graphed here, it's the correlation in intelligence. So that people, that kids were given intelligence tests, um, the monozygotic twins reared together had a correlation of about 0.82 or 0.83, where the monozygotic twins reared apart had a correlation just about 0.7. So you can see that rearing made a difference. 
to that similarity. Let's look down here where they have no genetic overlap, the adopted parent and the child, but who lived together, oops, moving too fast here, um, who lived in the same family, that's a typical adoption. It's between a 0.1 and a 0.2, let's call it 0.2 just for making it easier to speak about. And, and um, it, it, we also have another estimate when there's no genetic material of two adopted si siblings reared together. That happens actually quite often. I have some friends in Reston that adopted two Chinese girls some years ago. The girls had no special relationship to each other. And if we gave pairs of adoptive siblings read together IQ tests, on average, we'd find a correlation between of about 0.4. But if we take the adoptive parent and the child, um, it, it, so you take my friends, the adults who live in Reston and look at their IQ against either one of their two daughters, it is smaller, it's closer to 0.18. And so it is with these 50% shared, fraternal twins reared together, 50%, that is um, uh, true of all siblings, um, but fraternal twins have a slightly higher correlation um, than any old sibling, your brothers, you with your brother or sister. Um, so there might be something important about being a twin, maybe inner uterine experiences or experiences growing up because you were put together more because you were twins. We don't know, but we can only say that the correlation here is around 0.55 between fraternal twins reared together. And look at that, it was much bigger up here for identical twins reared together. So this tells us there's some genetic element. Siblings reared together, this may tell us that there's something different about treatment of fraternal twins, that's an environmental effect. And what about siblings reared apart? I don't think it happens terribly often now in America, but I know in Africa where HIV positive parents are very common, one of the things that happens is the, if the parents pass away, the children are shared out often among neighbors or among aunts and uncles, and the siblings are reared apart. If we gave those guys intelligence tests, pairs of, of siblings that are reared apart, we would find their correlation is closer to about 0 0.2, 0 0.22 or something. The all th these three groups here all share 50% of genetics in common. So it suggests environmental reasons for uh, the differences in those correlations. And we can go through and um, look at all possible arrangements. In fact, nowadays where there's a lot of blended families, it turns out that the list of uh, possible relationships is much longer uh, than it used to be. Well, here's the routine way to calculate the heritability from a twin study. You set up the conceptual equations. The correlation between monozygotic, that's identical twins reared together, that's the T, is a heritability plus the component for uh, shared environment plus, oops, I should have just said E for non-shared environment and um, the error of measurement. For the dizygotic twins um, uh, re reared together, that's the fraternals, they only share half of their genetic material, but all the other terms are the same. And the way they, we've been calculating the heritability is simply taking this value and subtracting this value. And if you look at it, if we subtract 100% genetics from 50% genetics, we're gonna have 50% genetics left over. These just cancel out because they're the same in the two conceptual equations. So without a lot of algebra, one thing we did was we look at the difference between the similarities between monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins, and we double it. And that gives us the value of heritability. 
for the variants of the two groups. Um, and uh, what about the genetic and environmental influences though that might change with age? And we began to talk about this last time. This is a what they call a meta-analysis study, looking at other people's studies. Um, and indeed, in, in this case, um, there were actually um, four countries and six different twin studies. Um, and they also um, looked at adoptive siblings so that they had, um, I don't have the, oh, only 300 adoptive siblings. Uh, it's actually quite a lot easier to find twins than it is to find adoption and give tests to the, uh, like the parent and the child and uh, so forth. If you look here, the average value of heritability from three and a half years old on up, these were from different studies, um, but it gets higher and higher. So that by the time you get twins that are 45 or 75 years old, what happens is 70 to 80 percent of the IQ variance is due to genetic causes, where shared environment has the opposite trend. With shared environment, it starts out being pretty important, and by the time you get up to past adolescence, it becomes very small. A lot of people say that's because you would expect family influence for younger kids getting to be less and less. The non-shared remember is what's left over. And in fact, this also includes the error in this table. So um, it, it's a trend that we're gonna see over and over that age makes a difference. There are a couple explanations for why does the genetic component increase? Um, one explanation is genetic. It says there are new influences from are genes that weren't present before. And if you think, oh, that sounds unlikely, just think about, well, teeth. We start out at first, there are no teeth, and then within the year, first year or two, melt teeth come in. Um, and then by the time a person is in late adolescence, their permanent teeth have been replaced and um, uh, so forth. So there are genetic influences that are happening and must be programmed in some way by the genetics um, that we have in our DNA and all our cells. An environmental explanation is that choosing, now this is for IQ, choosing to learn more amplifies the way that people are genetically better in intelligence or choosing not to learn, not going to school, not going to, not reading, um, can make people genetically less similar. And so the actual choice of the environment can alter um, and cause age to have, uh, we see differences in the heritability over age. Well, a lot of people have asked that question and noticed that age is often important when we calculate heritabilities. And we have to say, what is special about people who want to do mental exercises when they're older? And I wanted to show you a study. This is really because I think it's kind of fun. Um, also, it's a, a well-known researcher with older adults, Salthouse and a group of people from his research, I think he's down in Atlanta in Emory, um, I went around and talked to 1,200 adults who were between, yeah, from young adults to older adults, and their oldest ones were 97. And they asked for them to say what things they did during their day. Uh, and one of the, they then got a cognitive psychologist to say which of the tasks that these people did were mentally challenging and they made a little scale. So the attending classes like coming to Ollie puts you with a rating of four for the cognitive demand. Doing crosswords is around 3.9, pretty close to attending classes. Using a computer, you can see and playing bridge are sort of in a next group, computer use, playing bridge, 
reading novels is down a little bit and reading newspapers. And the, the least cognitively challenging in the set that I've given you, there were many more activities than their original, uh, was watching TV. And what um, they did was they were interested in whether this influenced the IQ test scores that they gave to people. And to, when they gave IQ tests, they did the expensive way. They got this personal individual testing with the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale. And I think I mentioned it last week, it has 10 subscales because many people who study intelligence say, oh, it's not just one number. We're not smart with everything. Indeed, one of the ideas about intelligence is we have musical intelligence. We have no nothing to do with, uh, well, not perhaps much to do with reasoning, which is what most intelligence tests test. Um, we might also have proprioceptive intelligence. That's being able to um, know where your limbs are and so forth. Well, in the, but this, these guys focused on the cognitive side and the waste test of vocabulary was given. Spatial relations, that's a test where you look at perhaps a figure, a shape, and then you match um, and a, a series of shapes, and then you match the next shape that would go in the series. That's a kind of spatial relations test. A third one was paired associates. That's a memory score. And digit symbol, they call it perceptual speed, but it's where you're given a code and you have, um, let's think of it as Morse code, and you have to um, put with the, the Morse code what the actual letter represents. So what they found was those who do cognitive challenging tasks score higher on all mental tasks than those who don't do those cognitively challenging tasks. And you can see here, they've divided them into the top quarter, the top 25% who did a higher cognition challenging task. There were about 300 in that group. And um, a bottom group, another 300 who were, did, did a lot of television watching, didn't do the challenging task. And you can see in every case, the solid line is above for most of the ages, because age is uh, down here on the um, uh, horizontal axis, um, is above. So people who spend their time doing cognitively challenging tasks score better on all the subtests that are shown here. Um, but uh, and if you look at it, the age trends are similar for both the high challenging task group and the low challenge task group um, uh, with decreasing scores after about age 50, not for vocabulary, but that's certainly true on the memory scores that Saltask found. And it's certainly true for chronolo um, sorry, for the digit symbol. Um, the little dotted line in the middle is the average for their whole group. Um, and you can see that uh, in general, vocabulary stayed constant if people were going to classes doing crosswords. Um, if they spent a lot of time doing the low cognitively challenging tasks, it, uh, it was less than the average and it went down. There was a big dip around 75 years old. Uh, but the basic trend is down um, in each group. Well, Stein Morrow, did a study and she called it the title Dumbledore Hypothesis of Cognitive Aging. And what she did was read Harry Potter and um, she found that Dumbledore, the uh, principal tells Harry, it's our choices that show that what we truly are far more than our abilities. So, she argues that choosing to do certain things like cognitively challenging tasks or low challenge tasks, one of the things it does is it can focus our attention. Another is that we practice the tasks that we do a lot. So if you do 
crosswords, you do a lot of crosswords. If you watch TV, you might watch a lot of TV. And this practice can enhance our capacity. And if you remember, um, we looked at an example um, the uh, last week of uh, uh, musicians and how actually in the brain, the representation for the separate fingers of the hands of um, players who use their left hand, that's my left hand, to make different notes as, as a guitar player would, um, uh, actually uh, would more space in the brains of those um, people who practiced a great deal than in with non-musicians, but just on the hand that was used, that was practiced with the right hand that strums the guitar, there was no difference between the non-musicians and like the guitar players. Well, in her study, it, which is not so terribly important here, but she did show that with two different sets of instructions that two different ages gave, had different strategies. You can see when people were told to read for accuracy, her young people and her old people were told to read for accuracy once and then to read for efficiency a second time, sometimes in the opposite order. Um, what they found was that the young people made a much bigger difference between the different instructions than the older people. It, it, my guess is this is how dense the reading material was. My guess is that young people have learned to skim better maybe than older people. Um, but she found that the accuracy was always, if you were instructed to read for accuracy, it was always better whether you were young or old. But if the efficiency, the seniors didn't reduce their time to get the um, gist of the material as much as the young people did. But as an oldie, as I said, I think it's because young people do a lot of skimming. Well, and she said, does personality count? And there are some genetic and environmental influences on that variable too. So in defining personality, this is using the behavior genetics method, we have to define something to start with. The people who study personality say a trait is any relatively enduring style of thinking, feeling, and action. In most cultures, there's a small number of dimensions of personality. And we're going to talk about two quite popular ways of evaluating personality by research psychologists um, using five or six different dimensions of personality. There are tests that test 14 or 15 or many more, um, but the ones we're going to focus on is the ones that reduce it to a smaller number of dimensions. Well, like anything else, how can we evaluate personality? One is we can observe people and we can get friends to report actions and the feelings of someone they know. Um, I always like that part the best. Um, behavior of the person, how often the person maybe attends parties or how often they go jogging alone. So we could do observation, we could look at behavior and the one that's used the most with personality is self-report. And for instance, um, uh, people are give, asked to give answers to questions about their style of thinking, feeling or actions. Um, personality tests used frequently, their error of measurement is much bigger than for IQ tests. Um, the main um, IQ or personality test that's used these days is based on five-factor theory by Costa and McRae. Um, it's called the NEO test, and I'll explain why the name. It was really started in 1978, but its error of measurement is about 0.25. In other words, that if a person took it twice, about a quarter of the answers would change. Um, and uh, the, what are the five factors? 
Well, Costa and McRae said they had isolated these five different aspects of personality. NEO, that's where the NEO test, the first they called neuroticism, the second extroversion, the third openness, then agreeableness, and then conscientiousness. Now, if you look at them, what they do is they place an individual after they standardize the test on a continuum. For neuroticism, one side of the trait is people who are incredibly laid back, almost asleep. On the opposite side is being very anxious, um, so much so that uh, it, 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 they're jumpy almost. And most people, of course, fall somewhere in between. For extroversion scale, these are called separate scales, um, there's the introvert on one side of the trait and extrovert on the opposite. The fact that I put one on the left and one on the right is just chance. It has, it, it, it's sometimes good to be an extrovert. It's sometimes good to be an introvert. Um, there's no better, but most people have a characteristic pattern. Um, and so they fall somewhere on the continuum within that error of measurement. Openness measures same people who prefer the same to keep things the same uh, on one end and the other, those who pref prefer having everything new. Agreeableness, I'm sure you could have guessed the two ends here, antagonistic on one end, it's like the little two-year-old who says no to everything you suggest, and agreeableness, somebody who's a yes person. Um, conscientiousness, somebody who's totally flippant on one side and highly disciplined on the other side. I thought, and when I have taught this before, I actually happen to have a copy of the a, an NEO test that it has 60 questions, 12 each on each of the five um, uh, of these different scales. And I thought you might like to hear the kinds of questions you would have to answer if you were taking it. One for the um, laid back side on the neurotic scale, I am not a worrier. Um, or on the anxious side, I often get angry at the way people treat me. So what would happen is I told you there are 12 different questions that contribute to the neuroticism scale. It looks at how many you answer on the laid back side and how many on the anxious side. And they've been pretty careful to balance how often it's said in the negative and how often it's said in the positive as well. Extroversion, um, I really enjoy talking to people would be on the extrovert side. Introvert, I am not a cheerful optimist, which would be on the more introverted side. Openness, I enjoy playing with theories or abstract ideas. That would be people who prefer newness. Um, people who prefer oneness, the question, uh, one of their questions is, once I find a right way to do something, I stick to it. Um, many people would just say it's stubbornness, but that uh, uh, doesn't fit within the academic investigation of personality. Agreeableness. Um, I'm hard-headed and tough-minded in my attitudes, or I would rather cooperate with people than compete with them. I've tried to choose of the 12 questions of each scale, ones that are pretty illustrative. Conscientiousness, I have a clear set of goals and work toward them in an orderly fashion. That's definitely the discipline. Um, but uh, here's a, um, on more on the flippant side, I never seem to be able to get organized. Now, these are again, personality at, uh, tests. The questions were chosen from a huge set of questions and ended, they ended up with only 60 that, that distinguished people on say extroversion, introvert, the best 60 and the same with agreeableness and for each one. That was, went into the, say, five-year procedure to come up with the norms. In the end, they had a sample of about 1,000 people, 
varied ages. These people worked in Baltimore and they followed through in a big Baltimore study and also had a big group of job applicants when they made the standardized five-factor theory test. In a recent modification, they have six factors. Um, five are the, the same, basically, as in the five-factor one, but they add one. And this is a paper that came out last year um, based on four nations. It was, they're European, Croatia, Finland, Germany, and the UK. People were between 14 and 90 years old, and they had 7,000 pairs of twins. The one factor that is not in the five factor is sets of questions about honesty and humility. Um, instead of calling the first factor neuroticism, they called it emotionality. So that's where you get the H for honesty, E for emotionality, and the X, they just went for the second letter in extroversion. And then they also had agreeableness, conscientiousness, and openness. So what are the, um, uh, what's the error of measurement? I would say about 500%. And you're being, you do French press coffee, so people are also brewing more at home. So 500% increase. I'm not sure where we're getting that. Uh, uh, how much of that is because of, you know, just about support, the movement. Yeah, I wonder, Meg, if you could mute wherever that's coming from. Um, anyway, um, the error of measurement overall for the NEO test, as I said, is about 25%, but it's not the same for each of the scales. Agreeableness has 35% error, whereas the one they call neuroticism has a 15% error. So it does vary with the particular personality trait you're looking at. Here in the study that Candler and co-authors wrote, um, the error of measurement was again about 25%. And it was a little different for the different ones. Um, agreeableness was one of the higher errors. And uh, one of the lower errors was, uh, this is emotionality, actually was extroversion in their particular um, personality test. Well, the openness score refers to choices in time allocation. Remember Dumbledore's advice. Older adults who were more likely to be in the highest Salatos group on IQ turned out to be the people who actually chose, were sorry, uh, the group who actually chose the more cognitively challenging. Um, and again, age is a factor in personality findings. Um, age stability um, is similar when people do the test several times. And up to about age 30, people change their scores on the personality traits um, so that you see, and it becomes pretty constant after the age of 30. Uh, you often wonder if maybe why people's friendships uh, change um, and become more stable uh, from middle age onward, um, possibly because of some personality test score changes. Um, it, I, one of the things that happens in general with age is emotionality and thrill seeking tends to decrease after you're 30 years old. Uh, but increases in self-discipline and cooperation. Again, that's nothing surprising, at least not for us, uh, who would be uh, spending time at a lecture. Well, for extroversion, let's work out the heritability and the uh, shared environment. This is a report of a summary of a lot of studies totaling 25,000 twin pairs from five countries. What they did was they recruited twin pairs, they gave the personality test uh, to the different partners in each twin set, and they calculated the similarity coefficient R. The test manufacturer published the error of measurement. 
they went and used those same conceptual equations that the identical twins have all of their genetics in common, plus the usual other terms for environment and error. The fraternal twins share half their genetics, plus all of the other environmental and error terms. Um, they then do a subtraction um, and they calculate what the correlation between partners in twin pairs are, and they find it's higher for the identical twins than for the fraternals. And when they work it out, it turns out that heritability, based on several studies, five countries, 25,000 twin pairs, heritability of personality scale extroversion was around 0.54. About half of the variability uh, is accounted for by genetic causes. We can't get the shared environmental values unless we do something with adoption. And, uh, but when adoption studies are compared, what they find is the shared environment has almost no, uh, doesn't account for almost any of the variants of extroversion. So about half for extroversion from genetic sources, very little from the um, uh, shared environment. And so our picture, our pie chart would represent very little. I've made a little wedge here for shared environment. We know the error of measurement um, for extroversion is about 0.25. And uh, so that leaves us about 0.2, actually probably a little more for the independent environmental effects that happen differently to people in the same home. I picked up the one we had for IQ and you can see the heritability is about the same. But what has changed? Well, error has changed. Um, uh, Non-shared error hasn't changed too much, but the shared environment is much less for a per the personality variable of extroversion than it was for IQ. Well, um, here's a, the genetic influence uh, on personality test traits is about 50%. Um, shared family environment is negligible. This was based on a study of 18,000 different traits, because we don't have to stick with just these, and of 7,000 twin pairs. And you can see it does vary a little with the particular personality scale, but it is around about 50%. And in every case, the shared environmental effect for personality was near zero. Well, at this point, I want to turn to looking at other kinds of social interactions and behaviors. First of all, you need to think this behavior genetic method can be applied to any measurable behavior or trait. Um, we don't have to limit it to things that uh, are their standardized test for. But indeed, another little piece I want to bring in is that nowadays people don't do it with the straight people being researchers, don't work out the heritability and environmental components with a simple subtraction, they tend to do some model fitting. And I'll show you what that means as we proceed and looking at some examples here. Okay, let's look at political attitudes. These can be measured and are mostly measured with self-report questionnaires. Of course, one could, um, uh, in fact, uh, not just use self, um, uh, questionnaires, one could look at um, behaviors, look at voting behaviors, um, and you could have some observation studies. But for the ones we're going to talk about, most of them have been measured with self-report questionnaires. Indeed, one questionnaire was developed in 1968, and it's called the Wilson-Patterson Inventory. Um, what happens is if one of the experiments is taking place in Australia, they change which of the issues they look at. 
And what people answer when they are given this questionnaire is whether they agree with uh, the issue, they're uncertain about their opinion toward it, or they disagree. And here are some examples, gay rights, divorce, astrology, death penalty. You can agree in favor of gay rights, you can um, be uncertain about divorce, you can disagree with astrology, uh, you'll have a mix of those answers. Um, and it, in the end, it gives you a score that puts you on a continuum between conservative political values and liberal political values. So in a study by Eves in 1997, um, Eves works in uh, Virginia in the big Virginia study, which we'll be talking about. Um, it had 30,000 twin pairs and family members, and then some volunteers from the AARP. The Virginia study of twins, these are volunteers only in one sense, um, they found the names of 30,000 twins who had been born in a certain period in Virginia. And they went to the DMV and got addresses and asked, would you participate in experiments? And they got, I think it was 70 to 75%. Yes, they would. Um, uh, when you start advertising for volunteers like they did in the AARP magazine and website, um, you get more uh, bias toward people who are willing to volunteer. But in this particular study, they looked at roughly 34,000 monozygotic twins and 38,000 dizygotic twins. What they found for the location of where a person is on the political continuum between being conservative and liberal was there was a very low heritability for anybody they tested who was younger than 20 years old, but a very high shared environmental component. But for people 21 and older, there was a high heritability and a very tiny shared environmental effect. And they also found some age trends. Um, uh, this is just to, uh, uh, as a different study than the one we just talked about, but did use the Virginia sample of 30,000 twins um, plus the AARP volunteers. They had 16 to 72 year olds who replied to, they didn't actually go to these people, they sent it, um, a, a yes, uh, I don't know, no, in agreeing with the, uh, the issues, I've put a few more of them here. Do you like modern art, X-rated mo movies, property tax, death penalty, segregation? It has 28 of these issues and people are rated where they fall on the continuum for conservative to liberal. Uh, in general, older respondents scored higher on the conservatism scale. And what I'm showing you here is a graph from the Truett paper. Um, uh, it's se separated for males and females. And although there were some differences, it wasn't, they weren't huge, but you can see the big trend is the older the age of the respondent, the more likely they had a higher conservative score, the less likely they had liberal score. In another study by Eves, um, that's the one we just talked about. Um, uh, we could actually work out the heritability because uh, they give their actual scores, the correlations between the monozygotic twins, that's this upper line, and between the dizygotic twins. And if there's a bigger difference between them, we have higher heritability because that's how we calculate heritability. And you can see that for like the 67 year olds, um, tw uh, twins, they heritability about 0.54. For twins that were 17, they were on top of each other, hardly any genetic component. So there again, you see an age effect coming in. 
there were uh, there's another whole set of people who study twins in Minnesota. Um, and uh, this one was published in 2006. They called it the traditional moral value triad. And they were trying to define what we mean as traditionalism. And they said, well, traditionalism is really a score that combines three moral values. One, tests of authoritarianism, conservatism, and religiousness religiousness. And they authoritarianism is how often you agree that an authority should have the power and uh, uh, other people shouldn't. We've just talked about conservative liberal issues and uh, the different bias that the participant has. And then there's religiousness. Um, uh, and a, a whole set of questions about how uh, important are religious um, factors. Uh, and when they look at the scores on the authoritarianism, conservatism and religiousness uh, scales, they find that they correlate with each other very highly. Um, and they argued uh, that this is Koenig and Bouchard, that they show um, each of those different kinds of tests show attitudes toward authorities. In one case, political authorities, another social, another family, um, uh, uh, religious authorities. Um, and they thought that is what makes up what they mean by traditionalism. And if you're in a personality theorist, you have to show that these three really do combine to make traditionalism what we usually mean by people who are uh, traditionalism. Um, they used a special set of the twins from their big twin sample in Minnesota. These are ones who were raised in separate homes from infancy. Because one of the problems you have um, of comparing twins that have been raised apart is or siblings that are raised apart is the age when they were separated. So these are the ones that were separated um, very early uh, by the time they were, I think it was one year old. Um, and they have only 66 pairs and 53 pairs of the dizygotic twins. Their average age was 45, but they varied in age from 18 to 77. They calculated the heritability using the usual method. Um, and um, it, what they found was for authoritarianism, there was a big genetic element. We're talking here on average 45 year old people. For conservatism, there was a pretty big one, 53%. But for religiousness, that scale showed almost all was due to genetic pressures or genetic influence. For their test of traditionalism, it too had a very high genetic uh, component. And they tested different models. One model was when they said, well, on our traditionalism, they call it the TMVT, the traditional moral value triad, um, when we combine the attitudes toward authorities, um, a, the political attitudes and religious attitudes together, they got the best um, model uh, that fit their data of all the cost possible correlations between the identical to the uh, twin pairs on all four of these different scores and compared it to the ones of the fraternal twin pairs. The least good model is when the three different attitudes were thought to independently influence the traditionalism score. So in fact, that's when they concluded that, that their traditionalism test really showed attitudes toward authorities, whatever kind of authority, not the uh, not uh, separate, completely separate um, attitudes. What about twin studies on religious attitudes? 
Well, here's back to the Virginia sample of 37. Um, they had 14,781 twins. In fact, if you work it out as pairs, it's only 7,000 twin pairs. Some family members, some spouses, some children and siblings. And in their paper, they only report the data for females because they said males were just the same picture, but they were slightly lower throughout. Well, come on up, there we go. So for the monozygotic twins raised together, each of them took their religious attitudes questionnaire and one part, one scale was religious affiliation and they correlated 0.77. Pairs of dizygotic twins correlated 0.65 on that same uh, questionnaire. Um, it, they had a set of questions in their questionnaire that was endorsement of the religious right. And here you can see the monozygotic twins and the uh, dizygotic twins differed by, their correlations were different by about 0.2. Um, and um, if they looked at the extroversion score on the NEO, and they found um, a difference of almost 0.4 between the identical twins and the fraternal twins. I'm gonna talk about church attendance in just a minute. Um, but just looking at the fact that the monozygotic twins were always more similar than the dizygotic twins, in every part of their study suggests there was some genetic involvement in religious attitudes. Um, but we also know that shared household is also important here on church attendance. Um, and one of the things is they had the spouses of these um, twins. Uh, the spouses are not twins as well. Um, but they actually gave the test to the spouses and they looked at the correlation between uh, a twin partner and that twin partner's spouse. And notice it was 0.71 about church attendance, which was even higher than the two monozygotic twin partners. Um, and that certainly suggests that living in the same household, you would expect that the spouses live in the same household. Um, uh, uh, whereas the monozygotic twins raised together are no longer living in the same household, um, suggests that there's certainly an environmental shared household effect, especially on church attendance. Not much on, on extroversion um, and so forth. You can look at these, but again, we find some genetic involvement. Um, Here's a more a, a comprehensive summary from that same study. The religious right um, endorsement, the heritability, and it's broken into two pieces, additive and non-additive. For those who know a lot about statistics, um, you need to work with these two as two separate quantities. And we'll talk a little more about that next week. But you can see and church attendance, the heritability was about 25, 20, between 25 and, and 30%. Shared environment on religious right endorsement was quite small. That's from the household where people were raised. Um, a non-shared environment had a much bigger influence on religious right endorsement and for that matter on church attendance. Uh, the covariance of genetics and environment, that's to do here with the non-additive, we'll talk about another time. But other sources, that's the non-shared and the error of measurement, with relatively small. The big information here in this picture is how important the unique environment, the events that happen to an individual when they're not in the same household are um, in relation to um, religious attitudes. So uh, I don't have a copy of what the error is. Nowadays, they usually just put together the error of measurement with the non-shared or um, the unique environmental factor. 
in a summary of the Minnesota twins who were raised apart, um, interest in spiritual matters ranged from around heritability of 30% to 45%. Shared environment went from 20 to 40. So it was higher than in this Virginia study where these twins were generally raised together. The choice of a specific religion in Bouchard's study was near zero, almost no heritability at all. Um, and you can't do the shared environment when the, the twins are raised apart. So we can't work that out. Well, another attitude I've tried, when I looked at line and how many papers there are where people have estimated G and E, and about 7,000. And I've tried to choose ones that I thought you'd find of interest. Almost anything you can measure, you can do the, work out the heritability and the environmental components. So what did they do for marriage? Well, this is also going to illustrate a change from the statistical view. Um, in a twin study of marriage, um, McHugh and Lincoln are from the Minneapolis group. Um, the sample is 7,000 couples. Um, they looked at um, uh, in Minnesota in the late 1980s, they filled out a questionnaire. They were 34 to 53 years old. They averaged around 40, had been married 15 years. And in their case, they took 1,300 identical twin pairs and 1,000 fraternal twin pairs. In both cases, it turned out more women agreed to answer than men. And the findings, well, now you can't do a correlation because you're either married or you're not married. Um, and instead you have to do something, it's actually it got an, it called a correlation, but it's called a tetrachora correlation. You would look for concordance between the twins, whether they're both married or they both unmarried. And you contrast that to discordant where one is married and the other isn't. And you can estimate the correlation for marriage. And it turns out the tetrachoric correlation for the identical pair of twins where they were raised together is 0.72. For the fraternal twins raised together is only 0.21. That tells you the choice of being married has at least some genetic element. When they worked out the heritability, it came to 0.58. And we're putting everything else into the, the environment. It's not just non-shared, it's also shared. Um, it's 0.42. Um, it's an estimate of the propensity to choose marriage. Um, what about comparing people's propensity to be married with their willingness to be divorced? And many people have looked at, for instance, what are reasons people accept divorce? And here's an, it's a study based on a Vietnam era registry um, of 6,200 twin pairs. Um, what they find is the additive genetic variance for being married, that's what my little M is here, is around 0.46. So that's the genetic component. We've been calling it G. In their study, they call it A because it refers just to the additive genetic variants. And here for the heritability of willingness to be divorced, it's about 0.29. The common environment, which they call the shared in is environment, is now labeled a C for common environment. And it's usually thought of as the rearing environment. The environment of the unique environment, things that happen to one child, but not to another in the family, we've called the non-shared. And that's the phrase they did at the beginning when the behavior geneticists were doing their studies. And the error of measurement is just combined into something called E. And when people make a lot of uh, models, they call them the ACE models. They're models of what they expect from independent logic of genetic variants from the common environment 
and from the environment that's unique to the individuals that also includes the error. So look at what's happened. Here in this study of about 6,200 twin pairs, having ever been married, had additive variance about 0.46. That's the G that we've been talking about, the genetic contribution. The um, only about a 0.11 for the shared environment, the common um, environment, and all the rest, the environment and error was about 0.43. So about equal from a genetic and from the unique environment. What about ever being divorced? Well, it turns out the genetic element is much smaller. If I call that, a, 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 it's almost double uh, in ever being married, but ever being divorced, the genetic element's only about half as big. The common environment is even less than it was uh, for getting married to being divorced. And for all the rest, that's where most of the variance comes from in being divorced. It, here it's about equal between the genetic being married has about an equal proportion of genetic and um, unique environment effects. Here we see much bigger effects, at least twice as much for the individual events that have happened to individuals. And when they compare different models, this was, uh, these were the models that worked the best. Each of these were independently predicting the um, propensity to be married or divorced. Twin studies, um, we find uh, of these people, 93% married of the uh, Vietnam veterans, 20% had divorced. Um, more similarity for the monozygotic than the dizygotic pairs. And so in Minnesota, the heritability came out about 0.52 um, uh, for divorce. And the veterans, it was a bit higher, 0.58. Here is a picture of a more recent 7,000 twin pairs, attitudes on divorce and the life event of getting a divorce. Um, we can just look overall. This is using the ACE, A being additive genetics, C being family environment, raising uh, while being rearing family environment, and environment for everything else. And you can see um, we have a very big component here of the unique environmental events that happen to an individual. Um, and it varied with, um, uh, well, in this case, we don't have much error because you can go to legal uh, offices and you can find out who's been divorced and not divorced. And to the extent that you write that down correctly, um, you don't have much error of measurement. Um, the picture's a little different from males than females, but in each case, you can see how big this component of what we've been calling non-shared environment is um, in each of those cases. Well, you've been uh, here for long enough. Um, I wanted to have one little thought uh, about divorce and bioassays of stress transmitters in newlyweds. What I wanted to talk about is it's sort of a trailer for next week. Um, people have done what they uh, search for particular gene candidates that might be important in social behaviors, in this case, in divorce. So these authors uh, actually did bioassays of stress neurotransmitters in newlyweds. They measured the epinephrine um, in different individuals when they were um, early on in their marriage, when they were newlyweds. And I don't think they went to the ceremonies. I think they probably uh, were there within the first week or two. Um, and what happened is they measured 
um, the amount of epinephrine uh, in uh, the sample that they had. Um, and it varied, it was 22 to 34% higher in people who ended up divorcing 10 years later. It's similarly for other stress hormones. It wasn't just one that they used. They tested the people at night and in the day and there were similar trends. And what they found out was that the hormones, these are the epinephrine and the other stress hormones were more predictive of eventual divorce than personality test results. So going through the procedure of getting self-report didn't predict as well um, who was going to get divorced uh, uh, as uh, doing some physiological measure of the neurotransmitters. And those are usually called the candidate gene studies. Um, so let's do the last one. I, um, in some, we're going to do a poll in a minute, um, heritability and shared environment for personality and social attitudes can be estimated. That noise is from me. Um, behavior genetics method, recruit twins, adoptees, families, work out correlations. You can use it to estimate genetics and shared environment for any attitude or trait. You can use the simple formula, the subtraction of the uh, correlation between identical twins minus fraternal uh, twins, or you can compare different possible models of how genetics and environment are gonna work. The behavior genetics method shows that some genetic origin for personality traits, in fact, that was about 50%, some for political attitudes, some for religious behaviors, even a huge amount for some religious behaviors and attitudes toward divorce and marriage, often around 50%, the genetic influence. Some shared environmental influences, but often they were very small for these particular social things, but it also depended on exactly what was measured. Okay, that was supposed to be a, um, a, a I'm going to call it a till, that's the cash register. Um, often genetics and environmental components change over age of the participants. We don't have a lot of time. Um, I think I'm going to have to skip the poll because I'm sure there's a few questions. Um, I can't see how many. Uh, yes, Panorea has had her hand up forever. And okay, let's let's go. I'll get out of. Um, I'll unstop my share. And I'll, okay. Yeah, there we go. Panorea, what's your question? My question is in the uh, in the study where they separated identical twins in Minnesota, and they put them in different environments. Did they put them in the same kind of environment of Basically, they had left same religion, same kind of society, same kind of economic level. I mean, Minnesota is Minnesota. How different can Minnesota people be from each other? Uh, I, I might be showing my ignorance here. Well, what I will say is uh, I didn't plant you, but one of the points, uh, one of the big themes for next week is... Um, where we evaluate the whole behavior genetic approach. And one of the assumptions is they were randomly placed. Well, we all know, in, at least in America, uh, where that Minnesota group uh, of uh, twins separated in infancy uh, were recruited from, they're not randomly placed. Um, and so um, that is, if, if when you get your, you don't have your assumptions met, then you're in a, in, in a situation where maybe um, uh, what we've been talking about is going to be incorrect because the assumptions aren't met. Yes, because I would think that they would put them in, in the same family environment that they would have been in if they had stayed there or something like that. Well, and I, you know, one would have to look at the whole background of each of the twins. Um, and uh, I'm sure if one looks carefully, that behavior genetics group up in Minnesota have a profile, but usually um, adoption and even just fostering 
of kids, uh, it tends to be middle-class people. And uh, they tend to be expected to be um, uh, stable homes. Yes, that, that's what I was thinking. And if you were going through a Catholic adoption center, then for sure there was going to be a Catholic home. Yes. Thank you. Is that mine? No. Do we have that any more questions? No, that was it. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, it is a real issue. And some of the other assumptions are also issues. Oh. Right. Okay. Anyone now, else? The, the one question we have two minutes less that I was wondering about. Are any of you surprised by the, the whole idea that uh, conservative liberal attitudes or attitudes toward things like uh, marriage and divorce might have a high genetic component? That was, um, at least with this kind of reasoning, that's where you get to. Okay, Steve, Greenhouse. Hi. Um, I think the uh, marriage propensity genetic component is biased because everybody, not everybody, but most people have uh, their parents were married too, and they come from a long line of married people. Uh, so I don't know how you can determine a genetic component of propensity to marriage. Well, I mean, if you think back, genetics is important that our species preserves the next generation. And a piece that the evolutionary psychologists look at is how we do this. And we, we get into issues of, um, because humans uh, have such a long period of development to independence. I mean, we're not born like uh, sheep that we can stand up right at birth. We have to work our way through. Um, and uh, many years be before we acquire the skills to be able to look after ourselves. This is all thought to be part probably of that 98% of the genetic material that goes from one generation to the next. But the variability in attitudes toward that um, is uh, what we're talking about with the estimates of uh, genetics and environmental components. I mean, there are like, if you look at birds, um, some birds keep the same partners, the same mates throughout their lives. And they might even um, uh, go to another place in the summer or winter, and then, then they come back, they keep the same mates. And many other birds don't do that. And so that is um, within the animal kingdom, there's a great deal of variability. With humans, um, there's some variability whether or not uh, uh, mates stay together. And indeed, one of the first things I'll show you next time is some data on uh, mate choice and genetic pieces and, and environmental pieces. The argument of the evolutionary psychologists is that women want to choose a, a man who is going to support them while they raise their offspring over a long period, where men may or may not be interested in that. And there have been a lot of studies that tried to show that differences between um, different, I'm gonna call them personality traits that people desire in a mate. And so uh, people have looked at that. Yeah, you're right, though. It's, it's probably um, tied up with our species being still here from one yep. generation to the next. Incidentally, um, I have read that um, very genetic variability amongst all people on, you know, on Earth is 0.1%, and that we're, we're, we share uh, one and a half or 2% of our genes with chimpanzees. Yes, and it depends who you read. I think they're just telling you a huge amount or a small amount. You, I can find, I, I collect data on people who tell me how many neurons we have. And they vary by 
orders of magnitude. Um, again, they're just saying lots. Um, it, the genetics guys are honing in on saying we have about 20,000 alleles that make us different. And all the rest, um, let's say we have a billion uh, 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 alleles or a, a billion base pairs in our DNA are the same. And only 20,000 might have some differences. And that's what people seem to be interested in. Who's smart? Who's not? Who's extrovert? Who's introvert? And we spend a lot of time figuring out that little tiny bit at the top. Yep. Yeah. Thank and whether it's 0.01 or 1% is kind of a guess. So. Panarea, you put your hand back up. Did you have another comment? Yes, I did. Yeah, you know, my mother, my mother had me when she was 40, so she was born in 1906. She was a very observant woman. And she could she realized that inheritance comes from it runs in families, intelligence runs in families. And um, I have always always believed in what she said. And sure enough, you've kind of uh, fulfilled her. Her prophecy of a woman who was born in 1906, to some degree. Well, I'm always scandalized when I think I'm like my parents. But on the other hand, I'm also appreciative. So, um, yes, in the studies of fraternal twins, I, I see a chat here. In the studies of fraternal twins, did they differentiate between same sex and opposite sex twins? Yes. And in almost all these studies where you see the MZT, it's only same sex if they have opposite uh, gendered twins, they're treated as a separate group because we know their DNA isn't the same. That sex chromosome, the 23rd chromosome, has in one case is XY and the other case is XX. So yes, and very early on, um, they always eliminate and they, they make sure it's same sex twin. Sorry, I have to leave, bye. Yeah, but there's a huge amount of, um, trouble, imagine trying to recruit all these people. Uh, right. Well, I think we should call it quits for today and um, come back next week and we'll talk about the evaluation of the behavior genetic enterprise and we'll talk about um, uh, this method they call genome-wide associations, which connects more directly to DNA as it is, it's just a gross measure, isn't it? 50%, what does that mean? We, it could be a lot of things. So thank you. <laughs>